All right, now if you're seeing this formula for the first time, it probably looks pretty scary. You got these delta x triangle things, got a limit in there. It's all pretty nasty, and you've also never heard of derivatives before when you first see this formula. But there's two good things about this formula. One is you're never going to see it again. It turns out there's way easier ways to find derivatives. So you'll learn about those in upcoming sections, and you'll pretty much forget this ever existed unless you take the AP test, or maybe you'll come across it on the final. So the good thing is you're never going to see it again after this quick section. Um, the other good thing about this is that you always know if you got the right answer or not. Because by the time you take a test on this, you'll already learn how to find derivatives all these other different easier ways that are harder to make mistakes on. So you'll be able to double check your work. Also, at the end of these problems, the little delta x in the denominator always cancels out. Because what happens is whenever you just you know, plug in 0 for whatever, you're always going to get 0 over 0, which is indeterminate. But then at the end of the problem, the delta x will cancel out, or it should. And that'll give you an answer other than 0 over 0. So that's what we're going to keep an eye out for. We should always know when the problem's over because of that. All right, so for starters, what does this word derivative mean? We're just talking about the slope. Now, other times you come across slope, I mean, tons of times, right? It's the slope of a line. So whatever angle a line is at, the slope is just how steep is it or whatever. But a line has a constant slope. If I have a line like this, not a very good line, but let's pretend that was a straight line. No matter where I draw a point, the slope's always the same, right? And that's the whole thing about a line, is the slope is constant the entire time. But if you look at a parabola like this one, or any other you know, squiggly thing, like a sine graph or whatever, the slope changes. If you're up here near the top, we got a very steep kind of upward positive slope. Same spot over here is actually going down. It's a negative slope of a pretty big number. And it's going to vary throughout, right? There's going to be a spot on here where the slope is probably zero. So just for a little bit of practice and get you in the mood of thinking about slopes again, let's take a look at the slope at a few different points. Now, we're not going to actually calculate it. That's what derivatives are all about, is figuring out the exact slope. But let's just try and ballpark it. You know? So if you wanted to draw a tangent line, which is a line that sort of like barely touches the curve, you know, just skims right past it at a point, then we can just figure it out. So let's take at the point at A. You know, if we drew a tangent line, it might look something like this. It's sort of, and it's obviously very steep, right? So I just want to estimate the slope. Just looking at this, it's more than one. A slope of one would be a 45 degree angle. Yeah, you know, more like right here we might have a slope of one. Up here though, it's a steeper slope. So maybe this is a slope of two up here. Down at B, kind of cool, that's the vertex of the parabola. So this, the tangent to that is actually the x-axis. It's horizontal and the slope of a horizontal line is zero. We really want to get in the habit of thinking about that. Horizontal slopes are a slope of zero. That's going to come up again and again in the first half of calculus, or actually throughout, probably. And then so point C, like we said, it's got a steep tangent line, and that's probably a slope of negative 2 or something, just a pretty steep negative slope. Because remember, down to the right is negative, up to the right is positive. All right, so that was estimating slope. But like I said, we're going to use derivatives to actually calculate the slope specifically for any given point on the curve. And the derivative, it's going to turn out, that's where we're going to use that big nasty limit equation to find. So I'm just going to give you it to you at this point that the, the, um, the parabola we were looking at was y equals x squared, just your classic parabola with a vertex at the origin. And I'm just going to tell you, and we'll learn how to find out, that the derivative, so y prime just means the derivative of y, and there's lots of different ways we can write that down, is going to equal 2x. So basically what we're saying is the slope at any given point along this parabola is given is just two times the x-coordinate. So if we go to the point 0, 0, then the slope equals 0. Because if we plug in 0, the x-coordinate, you'll 2 times 0 is 0, so the slope is 0 at this point. And that's what we estimated from the graph, right? Let's try a different point. Let's try this one right here. 1, 1 is another point that a parabola goes through. The x-coordinate is 1, so if you plug in 1, you'll get that y prime of 1, or just the slope at x equals 1, is just 2 times 1, which equals 2. Oh, so that's kind of interesting. The slope is actually 2 right here. And that's what I estimated the slope might be up here. Hmm. Let's try plugging in the point that we estimated at 2 and see what that is. I think that'll be 2 comma 4. So let's plug in 2 for x, and we'll get a slope of 4. So wow, that's interesting. This thing actually has a pretty steep slope already at x equals 2. And of course, as x gets bigger and bigger, the slope gets steeper and steeper, which is pretty much what you'd think would happen on a parabola. Something kind of tricky, though. Look at the slope over here at like negative 2, comma 4. 
Now this is shooting up really fast, right? It looks like it's taken off to infinity. So you might be thinking, wow, that's a really steep slope. That's a really big positive number. You know, the slope would be a big positive number, but it's not because over here, X is negative, which means when you plug in a negative number for the, to the slope equation, the derivative, you're going to get a negative number out. So the slope at negative two comma four is actually negative four, but that actually makes sense. I just bring this up because it's just a common misconception. I actually, you know, I have to sort of double think myself to get around this because to me it's so like obvious that the slope would be really big on both sides, but really going left, it's a big negative number. Going right, it's a big positive number. So that's just, that's a common mistake that, that uh, students make in derivatives, so. All right, so finally we're to the big nasty equation because the question is, you know, in that last slide, I just told you that the derivative of a parabola is 2x, but how do you get that? How do you find out it's 2x? If you had this in class already, you know that there's something called the power rule where all you do is you take the exponent and put it out front. And that works great, but this limit definition is something you do have to learn how to do even though it's a pain in the butt. All right, so what we're gonna do is just plug and chug through this formula right here. So start with f prime and that's gonna equal the limit is delta x approaches zero. I'm not even really gonna explain what delta x is. The point is that you just wanna to learn to plug and chug through this thing. If you're really interested in how to derive this, feel free to check out your book or whatever, but essentially we're just, this is a, a glorified version of the slope equation, which is y1 you know, minus y2 over x1 minus x2, if you've been using your entire algebra careers. So we got something minus something over the difference in x's. Delta just means difference, the difference in x values. So this is, the, this is the limit as the difference between two points, the two points get closer and closer and closer, the space between them approaches zero, we're gonna calculate the slope between those two points. All right, so we're just gonna plug and chug. So now we want f of x plus delta x. But what is f of delta of x plus delta x? I'll just work that separately here. Doesn't that just mean, when you wanna find f of something like f parentheses, two, you would just plug in two for x, like f of two, which would be two squared. So that means f of x plus delta x. We're just gonna take this sort of booger and plug it in for x right there. And that sounds messy and it is, but that's what's gonna happen. So if we, if we try and find x of x plus delta x, we just get x plus delta x squared. Fair enough, right? That's not so bad. So we're gonna replace this part of the equation f of x plus delta x with what we just got, x plus delta x squared. All right, and then we have a minus sign, so I'll put that right there, and then f of x. So that's just f of x with no weird triangles in it, and f of x was just x squared, right? That's the original thing we started with. Where is it? Oh, here we go. That's our original function, so we just put an x squared. And downstairs, delta x, we're just going to write delta x. All right, so at this point, we have plugged and chugged and just, you know, plugged into the formula. The, tr the big hard part of these problems is not that part, it's the simplification. All right, so let's get into it. I'm, what I'm going to have to do is just foil out this hunk of junk up here. So what is x plus delta x squared? It's x squared plus 2x delta x plus delta x squared. All right, if you don't believe me, pause the video right now, foil that out yourself, but uh, that should be it. And then we take away the x squared still, and of course, this is all over delta x. All right, so what did I just accomplish? Nothing. All I did was foil some junk out, but this is all the process. This is what's always going to happen in these problems, is you'll end up with a mess upstairs, but then you'll factor stuff out and reduce it and whatever and simplify, and things end up going kind of nicely. So check it out. I now have a positive x squared and negative x squared that cancel out. So at this point, my goal is to, fact, is to cancel out that delta x. Because right now, if I just plugged in, you know, whenever you have a limit problem, you want to just plug in. So if I, but if I just plug in 0 for delta x right now, I'll get 0 plus 0 over 0. So it's just 0 over 0, which is indeterminate. So that's why we're doing all this. The problem is I can't cancel out the delta x right now. I can see I probably will be able to, but just to show you what I'm doing, I'm going to factor out a delta x from the stuff that's left upstairs. So give me a 2x plus delta x, and that's still over delta x. And this is where the magic happens, and this step should happen every time you work on these problems. The delta x's cancel. 
and we're just and this is still limited as delta x yeah, approaches zero. By the way, all right. So the delta x is cancel, and now we have the limit as delta x approaches zero, except it's not a fraction anymore. So it's not indeterminate. So now we really can just plug in delta x approaching zero for any delta x we see, and this is the only one that's left. So when you plug in zero for that, you just get zero, and now we're left with two x. Isn't that amazing? That giant mess ended up giving us the 2x we expected. So pretty wonderful. I'm going to do a couple more of these, and you'll see that while they are a little bit messy, the same thing always happens. You plug in, you, you, know, you make a tremendous mess, you start factoring and simplifying and foiling and all that junk, and ultimately, you should be able to cancel the delta x from the denominator. All right, so this is another one. Let's try it. So what's f of x plus delta x? Well, let's see. In this case, so we're just going to do limit as delta x approaches 0. And then f of x plus delta x, this is f of x this time. So f of x plus delta x, we're just going to plug in x plus delta x to x in the original equation. And that is going to give us 2 times x plus delta x plus 3, don't forget. All right, so, that, so what I just did was that this is f of x plus delta x right here. Then I've got to take away the original f of x, which is just 2x plus 3. Now here's a really big opportunity to make an algebraic error, which is the kind of errors you'll make in these. It's subtracting f of x, right? So that means this has to be in parentheses, because I'm taking away all this junk. And that's really important. If you forget to do that or mess up that minus sign or don't put in parentheses, you'll get the answer. You won't get it wrong. You'll just get stuck and wonder why the delta x isn't canceling. And all this is over delta x. All right, it might not be obvious to you now, but this is probably indeterminate, so I'm just going to keep going. These are always indeterminate. All right, so next step. Limit as delta x approaches 0. And now I'm just going to distribute this negative sign to these two terms, because that's how stuff's going to cancel. I'm also going to foil this out right here, or distribute it. So I'm going to get 2x plus 2 delta x plus 3. And I distribute that negative sign in, I get negative 2x and minus 3. All right. I know this doesn't look like we're making any magic yet, but they always work out. So I have faith that if I don't make any algebraic errors, everything will cancel. And once again, look at this. 2x cancels negative 2x. 3 cancels negative 3. Aren't you glad we distributed that negative sign properly? I sure am. All right, so at this point, the only things left that haven't canceled is this right here. So just to make it look better, so that's still the limit as delta x approaches 0 of 2 delta x over delta x. Still indeterminate, except look at this. Bam, bam, those cancel, and I just get 2. Pretty fantastic. If you know your power rule, or you know how to find derivatives already from a little bit later section in this chapter, you probably already realized that the limit, that the um, derivative of 2x plus 3 is 2. And what does that mean? If we're saying that the derivative of this line always equals 2, does that make sense that slope would be constant? Because there's no x here. In the parabola case where we had y equals 2x, or y prime equals 2x, depending on what x was, the slope varied, right? As we went around the parabola, our slope of our tangent line kept changing. But for this one, we're saying, nope, no x's. It's just 2 all the time. Or facing your way, it's like, it's just 2 all the time. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, it does. Because this equation, we were finding the tangent the uh, slope of the tangent line of a line. So if you just graph 2x plus 3, what did that look like? It's like y-intercept of 3 and then a slope of 2. So it, wherever you draw a point anywhere in this line, isn't the tangent, I mean the slope of the line is constant, it's always 2, so it makes sense that the derivative would be a constant because the slope is the same everywhere, therefore the derivative is the same everywhere. All right, so last one. This is going to be slightly different than the ones we just did because instead of just asking for the derivative, like the formula with the x's in it that we'd get at the end of our limit problem, this time they want us to plug in 2. So that's just going to be one little extra step. But as you'll see, we can just plug in a number to it just like we could find f of, you know, f of 1 or f of 2 or whatever. So in the original equation, we could have just found f of 1 because that's just going to be 1 squared plus 3 is 4. Once we get an equation for f prime, we can just plug in 2, just like we'd plug in any other number. All right, so as usual, we're going to plug in a bunch of junk. So first steps first. 
Limit as x approaches 0. We'll have a giant fraction. All right, so what's next? First, we need to plug in, find this term, right? So this f of x plus delta x, we're just going to take x plus delta x and plug it in for x. In the next video, I'll work some harder ones where we might have to plug it in more than once. Like there might be an x squared term, there might be an x term also. But in these ones, um, with just the x squared, all we have to do is plug it in once. That's going to be x plus delta x squared. And that plus 3, it, we have to take with us also. Then minus sign, and remember we need parentheses here because we, don't, we want to distribute that negative to everything. So minus sign, and then everything that was in the original f of x, x squared plus 3. And downstairs is just delta x as usual. All right, so now we just got to simplify. At this point in the problem, they're all the same. Foil, simplify, subtract, cancel, whatever you got to do. Combine like terms. So the first thing we have to do is foil that puppy. x squared plus 2 delta x x plus delta x squared. Sometimes people ask me, you know, when you have delta x times x, which one do you write first? Is it x delta x or delta x x? Same thing, when you have things multiply together, it doesn't matter what order you put them in, so whatever you prefer, and it's all about making less mistakes. So if you find that when you write delta x, x, you're less likely to make a mistake than when you write x, delta x, whatever, just do whatever you feel most comfortable with. The key thing is to avoid errors. All right, then this negative sign, this is the biggest mistake you can make in this particular prepper problem, is messing up the negative sign. You've got to distribute it to everything in the original function. That's negative x squared minus 3. And you'll know you did that wrong if everything that you wanted to cancel doesn't cancel. All right, but as you can see, we, we did good because x squared cancels x squared, negative x squared, and what's the other one? Ooh, I forgot my plus 3. <laughs> see, that's what happens. I forgot to carry down my plus 3 to the next line, but that cancels that. So as you can see, I knew I made the mistake because I know that every single time I do one of these problems, everything cancels out that doesn't have a delta x in it. So the pattern you'll notice is that everything that has a delta x in it is going to end up, or that does not have a delta x in it, is going to cancel. So basically everything from the original function, all this stuff right that came from this term, is pretty much going to disappear via subtraction. All right, so at this point we're just down to this hunk of junk, these two terms upstairs and one downstairs. So we're going to do the factoring out thing. So we're factor out a delta x because we want that to cancel. 2x plus delta x. And it's still the limit as this approaches 0. All right, so delta x cancels delta x. And now we just got the limit as delta x approaches 0 of 2x plus delta x. And it's not indeterminate anymore because it's not a fraction anymore. And right after that step of where the deltas cancel, that's when, that's usually the very next thing you do is plug in 0. So we're just going to plug in a 0 for that. Of course, that just makes it go away. And we get a final answer of 2x. Now, this is kind of funky. Did you notice that this is the same derivative we got earlier? So in the first problem we did in this, in this um, video, we had y equals x squared, just your totally standard parabola with a vertex at the origin. And its derivative turned out to be y prime equals 2x. Just now we did a different parabola, one with x squared plus 3. Same derivative. This 3 didn't do anything. Well, it turns out the derivative of constants, like numbers like 3 and 4 and negative 6, are 0. Now, does that make sense? Well, yeah, it does, because the original problem we worked, the vertex was at the origin. So here's the origin right there. And now x squared plus 3 is just a parabola that's been shifted up 3 units. But you'll notice that the flat spot, for example, that just moves everything up one. It doesn't change it with respect to x. So you're still, you know, at x equals 0, we're still going to have a 0 slope for both parabolas because all those points of any given steepness are right above each other just separated by three units but they still have the same slope at any given value of x so that's why constants don't have a derivative now if we had moved the parabola around moved it left and right and up you know more like left and right then we'd have a different derivative formula but we also would have had a different equation because there would have been x squared like plus 2x or minus 3x or something there would have been a middle term that caused that horizontal shift so we would have had a different derivative anyway. All right, so let's take a crack. So as I mentioned before, this is the derivative, but that's not the final answer because we want to find f prime of 2. So all we're going to do is just plug in 2 
for x. So that's going to be 2 times 2 equals 4. And just to point out something, you're going to see a lot of different words meaning derivative, or a lot of different letters. y prime is the derivative of a y, but y and f are pretty much the same thing, so really that's just f prime. And it turns out that's the same thing as dy dx. Or, if they just want you to find the derivative of something, they might say, what's d over dx of, like, uh, x squared plus 3, as the problem we just did. So that's just saying, hey, take the derivative with respect to x, but we'll get into that in a later chapter, what that means. But the point is, this just means, hey, take the derivative of this stuff. This would also mean, take the derivative of that stuff. x squared plus 3, a lot of teachers don't do this, but if you just take the original function and put a little prime next to it, just like y prime means the derivative of a y, prime right here above the parentheses means, hey, take the derivative of everything inside. So a lot of different ways to notate this stuff or write it down. But, um, well, there you go. All right, so next video, we're going to do some nastier problems. Same type of problem, but just we'll have more plays to plug in, more ways to screw up, and maybe even some tricky algebra with denominators, and you'll see rational functions. If you're not in a really hard class, like if you're in... Um, calculus for business majors or whatever, there's a good chance that they won't ever get any harder than the ones we just did. But if you're in AP and you plan on taking an AP test, or if you're in a hard college class headed towards science or engineering or something, you'll probably want to stick around for the next video because it's good practice with algebra, if nothing else.